cool yeah. and we're live what is up dia koli it is uh, an honor to have you on the podcast um, you are the first writer that i've had on and um, your writings around travel and food have given me extensive hopes about a potential career in, in those domains should uh, my experiments in podcasting fail uh, so thank you for that thank you for doing this said i definitely hope they don't it's a career fraught with like tension and stress yeah i want to talk to you about that um, so you uh, you write f- everywhere from how adivasis um, you know um, are able to sort of uh, rekindle their uh, coffee growing uh, plantations using using help using the help of a company um, in 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 araku and you also at the same time talk about um, what what a kiss means on on the eve of international uh, you know kiss day so there's there's a there's there's a fair bit of journalism and sort of entering into india's unventured into parts uh, and bringing out journalistic stories uh, about uh, the intersection of i guess you know uh, small cottage industries tribals but then also like this other uh, startup uh, and then 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 there's the stuff that is more dreamy where you dissect uh, what a kiss means through several layers right i especially like the like the paragraph you had around how freud just devolved and de- like desecrated the kiss into nothing but a scientific definition um so i guess to sort of start things off how do you what are you when you go out and and you're trying to write an article or an essay what do you typically have in mind are you are you trying to inform or are you trying to like throw a whim out uh in in an articulate manner see i can't of this like being a journalist working mm. for the various organizations that i worked for it can't be a whim that i throw out there whatever story is being told or whatever story it is that i have to say has to have some larger resonance obviously so mm. whether i'm writing about i think to go back one should begin with the point that where does sort of lifestyle feature writing begin mm. and we're not breaking news we often take a new space which might be something which is like 100 words long that is our starting point for a mm. story like the story about araku coffee was something that began with just an announcement of this fact that this coffee from india grown in araku valley which one had barely heard about before that mm. was winning awards in paris and that was a pretty interesting thing that where did this coffee grown in the middle of nowhere one remote valley which is still sort of uh, you know struggling with naxal trouble which barely has any development how on earth did this place become associated with coffee that was winning awards in paris that you know roasters hmm. across europe were stocking in their cafes that was the beginning of that story and that was the starting point for a much larger story that then i went there to do which was to actually find out who are the people growing this coffee how do they learn how to grow this coffee what is the history of coffee growing in that area this is a place where coffee was introduced by the british back in the 19th century hmm. and they sort of uh, introduced it for their own drinking pleasure or whatever right and then it sort of languished after that nobody sort of took any interest in it the government forgot about this area there was because of the the naxal movement over there this area was largely forgotten it's also very very uh, remote in terms of accessibility till a few years back there was only one sort of motorable road through that entire region so it was largely a place where um, adivasis were sort of left to their own devices they either farmed according to their trip typical you know slash and burn sort of farming methods right. or they lived off the forest coffee plantations were entirely abandoned and then suddenly there was an impetus both by the government and then these ngos like the ngo which is behind this brand called the nandi foundation they came in helped these guys come up with new ways of farming which was biodynamic etc taught them how to grow plants you know in a symbiotic sort of manner mm. where there would be no pesticides and all of that and that's how they started growing this coffee and it's a remarkable story because these are people like going there sort of changes your perception of the story to begin with i went there right. to find out where the coffee came from once you go there you figure that here are these guys growing this fabulous coffee and they're people who've never drunk a cup of coffee in their lives 
like yeah. on actually probably being given one up they were like you know what is this this is bitter and terrible and i mean that's yeah. fine we'll grow it we get some money because so do, do, do they drink some sort of chai sorry do they drink some sort of chai yeah, yeah they drink very basic sort of the normal ctc chai that kind of thing right another very interesting thing one discovered over there while uh you know doing this coffee thing is these guys people have learned these farmers have learned how to farm in this very sort of you know all our hipster stores and farmers markets and all of that all the organic food that we get there right this is one of the places where they grow organic vegetables they grow like i saw like a patch of wonderful tomatoes that is grown according to the best practices those are the kind of things that would be centerpiece in all these places in like a uh, you know like salad bars in bandra yeah. and things like that yeah but the great i mean the irony again like these are people grow this fancy coffee don't drink coffee of course we'll never be able to even afford something like that right. if it's there in the market yeah is it it's sort of like at a pretty high price like something around 7500 rupees per kilo or 6400 rupees per kilo like yeah. in amsterdam yeah. or paris somewhere so that's like again coffee for markets which are like either foreign markets and in india also it it, it is something that's a very yeah. urban sort of you know uh like product so uh again going back to these organic vegetables so they grow these vegetables but mm. i ate like a meal over there and there was no vegetables in that meal so they don't eat too many vegetables because they realize the value that these vegetables are going to get in the market interesting and they traditionally therefore don't eat vegetables and like a lot of local health uh, organizations over there you know trying to tell people how to i mean to stave off malnutrition and all of that they tell them that you must include some greens in your diet but it's just the fact that these are the people growing you know this food for us for consumption for like you know across the world but they themselves don't eat it and they themselves actually don't have access to it in that sense they are eating your they have country chicken running wild they're eating rubbish broiler chicken yeah they have organic vegetables growing in the backyard they are eating no vegetables so yeah that's it all these things that So your starting point sorry what was your question your starting point was I I love this about? I love this tangent about uh, you know farmers not not eating their own produce cuz I think one of the no, I mean, that's the reality yeah. of a lot of lot of our country so it is once you visit these places that you you go in search of a story but then there is a another story that unfolds while you're there hmm. that shows you a lot about and this especially with respect to food writing it it brings home larger truths about where your sort of food comes from hmm. the whole journey that it travels from where it is grown to landing up in your supermarket wrapped in you know cling film hmm. or showcased in beautiful mason jars with brown yeah. paper really packaging. aesthetic packaging yep absolutely so it 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 is sort of that so it definitely it is not a whim so that is this angle which is the araku valley story which came from very yeah. definite and it was one going in search of that story for something like the story about a case that's like working for various lifestyle magazines and mm. writing for the web especially you often have to write to an audience you have to yeah. write according to say a specific theme a day etc which you know is going to get you like the views and the hits and all of that right but while writing a piece which might seem like really superficial or really sort of you know like out there and okay not very erudite if one has to mm. put it in that way. how do you work with that and still make it a piece which again as i said has a resonance has a has some more meaning than what is just a stupid listicle or is a piece just about like what a kiss means yeah there is a the uh, i mean there is more that you can introduce into it by drawing in history by drawing in politics by drawing in the cultural resonance of it and within that framework of lifestyle writing write something which is actually intelligent and a piece which which reaches out to people yeah you no know matter i matter what yeah. the subject might be that is I, always a challenge i think i have a big i have a big sort of bone to pick with everyone who um, graduates college somewhere in india and decides that they will be a writer and and uh, what i often see largely in in the scoop poops and and the other listically um, sort of writing that comes out is i know i know for a fact that this is being picked up from wikipedia i know that 
um, the first Google search that that you know we, that yielded like the first five research results, they've been sort of aggregated together into this mesh that has not been curated for reading pleasure. It does not inform me. Uh, I see it a lot as filler content, and that's that's the sort of reason why I love your writing so much. Is that it's almost like I'm reading, I'm reading in the middle of a novel, and so not only am I getting the the significance of what you know why why Cairo is is like particularly interesting for literature, or why you can totally go on, on a whim and explore Australia uh, and and discover vinyls, right? There's this this sort of uh, deliberate human curation that I see missing in a lot of the writing that I come across online, and that's that's the reason why I wanted to do this. Um, so you you started off in Jadapur University, right? And um, you decided that you will be a I writer. Off, I, yeah. No, I started off uh, in. I went to Delhi to study. I was hmm. in DU, Saint hmm. Stephen's College, and after that, I went to do my masters at Jadapur University. Um, well, I studied literature, which is yeah. probably the not the right route to take if you want to become a journalist going forward. Right. But I never knew at that point that I wanted to become a journalist at all. I thought I was going to study literature for a very long time and mm. become an academic. But uh, yeah, after studying for five years, I thought like, let me take a break and work for a year or two and then get back to studying. But like uh, how all those stories go, once you start working, then you're like, okay, I'll give it another year and another year. And so, yeah, that's, that's how my career changed yeah. to something else. And even at that point, my first job was actually at uh, a newspaper because that mm. seemed like a logical choice. I studied English. I had, uh, I could write. Well, I could write. Yeah. It doesn't mean I was a journalist or mm. I could write journalistically. But yeah, sure, I could write. So therefore, uh, yeah, that was a, a job that came my way. And um, it was in Calcutta. It was the Telegraph. It was a great brand. And uh, so I joined. Except my first year there was a was a wake up call, like many other young English grads who become journalists. You hmm. go into journalism with the aspiration of being a writer, yeah. which is the an absolutely wrong road to take because neither are you entirely journalist nor are you entirely writer in the process. Hmm. So it's. Uh, it's not advisable at all. It would have made sense maybe to go to journalism school, get a few things straight. Because mm. when you when you are in your first job, you are still dreaming of writing like, I don't know, T.S. Eliot or uh, right. recreating like, you know, like 19th century Victorian novels. But the reality of it is that as a rookie journalist for a lifestyle slash city paper or whatever, what you are doing is the, the worst beat in the world which yeah. is covering the opening of a brand new restaurant in town or going and doing the party beat where you have to ask people, what is the outfit and the designer that you're wearing? <laughs> so all your high flag notions are yeah. sort of nipped in the mud. So not to say that I didn't do some fun stories. I got to meet some like great writers. I got to meet Amitabh Ghosh who had studied till like a year before. It was great to interview him. You got to meet some really interesting characters, artists. I got to see the city that I'd grown up in, in a whole different light because mm. to cover every aspect of the city, even if it was like a restaurant opening or an art gallery preview or whatever it was, you got to go to different parts of the city, interact with people that I didn't in my earlier avatar, just as a person growing up yeah. in that city. So that was a great sort of an experience, but I guess one year of that and after the nth salon launch and the nth party or new band in town, I was like, yeah. maybe I need a change. That was one year of that. And then I, I, in fact, I needed a change so much that I was like, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to do journalism anymore. If I ever want to be a writer, this is the worst idea. Hmm. And so let me join publishing instead. Hmm. So, because that was also related to the world of writing, it was related to books and the, I had studied, I had done a course in publishing. So it, it made sense because you felt like one always wanted to be close to the world of writing because the idea hmm. was you wanted to be a writer. So be close to the world of writing, whether it's books, whether it's actually the printed word in terms right. of like the modern news. Find an in writing. somehow. Find an in somehow. Yeah. Again. As I yeah, but, but, but did you did you appreciate did you not appreciate the grunt work that you did for the Telegraph early on? It sort of might have allowed you to enter a disciplinary sort of period 
to um, dispel some myths around what is ideally considered to be like a dreamy writing maybe, world maybe it was a like i said it was a wake up call because it taught me what it was and that that world it was that i was entering hmm. but it also was uh entirely not the choice i should have like made at that point especially hmm. because at that point i was really my head was filled with literature and books and very like high grand notions of things this was a very rude shock in that sense yeah. so working for uh, i mean this was like a calcutta's version of a how to put it a bombay times perhaps okay or a, yeah just a little more like with a little more books and a little more like music and a little more culture thrown in but a version of that yeah it's sort of funny right when you cuz i remember this from my own i had this one terrible stint at this local faridabad magazine it was also a lifestyle magazine called whatsapp magazine and disbanded right after i left it and i joined as a student right and i was and so i i really like the idea of like seeing the city through this other lens as as someone who walks as someone who um takes lifts as someone who enters shops and conversations that one would never enter if one were just transitioning to these different places in the city absolutely. right absolutely right okay so take away that bit from it was something that i thought was that was that was a valuable thing that i took away from that but i also did realize that it was probably a good decision to leave at that point to explore mm. what one could do i mean a little better yeah so yeah no, the re- the reason i say that is because um i also realized early on that this magazine had me go to pet shops to interview the pet shop owner about their journey right and there was a sly inference that somehow the the extensive profile of the pet shop owner would invite generous funding for the magazine that did not happen so i was like this is just this is just bs and um but but to to sort of ex- extend on the notion of uh, seeing the city through the lens of someone who is there to ask questions as opposed to uh, seeing the city as as a resident is is something that i noticed again and again in your articles right even even when you went to the araku plantation or when you went to cairo or when you went to melbourne right the idea is to is to ask questions and to understand like what sort of pulse or what sort of the, what sort of like a uh, subculture exists in the city right and and this this happens uh, even in mumbai right when i when i was living in mumbai for the for the brief time period that i was in it was entirely different from when i would uh, travel to mumbai for a specific purpose in mind i would just stroll in and out of shops in bandra and ask questions and figure out like where i was and who I was living with absolutely yeah. what 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 skills do you think like how did you figure out that this is something that i have to do what did you get better at interviewing did you understand that you would have to learn a specific sort of street lingo to start having these these conversations and start seeing your city in a different light it's uh, it's more than the city that i belong to calcutta was different that this was a, a stint which showed me that but anywhere i traveled hmm. to very early on in fact, and you travel well. internationally extensively as well yeah I traveled somewhat not ex- mm. I wouldn't say extensively it's thanks to my various jobs with travel magazines that I've managed to travel a fair bit mm. uh it is at that point that one realizes that when you are working for a travel magazine we don't live in a world where places are unexplored where the world is a sort of a you know it's a mystery and a secret there aren't those there aren't undiscovered places anymore everything's been written about 100 times everybody has access to any kind of information you want about a city i if i was traveling to jerusalem or i was traveling to cairo there have been hundreds of books written about it one google search will give you all the restaurants you want to eat in all the sites you want to see there's so much out there already yeah. so what you bring to that as a travel writer what can you bring all you can bring is a different perspective and that same place those same sites those same restaurants that same food through a, through your lens perhaps mm-hmm. which is something then that someone else will read and be like hey that's a story i liked that's a perspective of that place that i liked and i want to walk those same roads so it's in order to find that story for yourself to find something about that city which interests you in the first place beyond what even i have read when i've done my research mm-hmm. is in walking that city in noticing small things those small things which might make a difference when you write about it in your story that mm. might add something new to your story mm. so i remember in like when i went to jerusalem again the subject of academic research the subject of of films of documentaries, documentaries. Yeah. Yeah, yeah has been done about it 
I'm not even someone who comes from like, I'm not even a political journalist that I'm going to bring some new insight on the current politics of the place. Or you're not Christian or Jewish or, uh, you know, Muslim as well. No, and neither am I any yeah. of those things. So the thing is then what do I bring that, that does not, that cannot, you firstly cannot ignore this. You cannot ignore mm. this political history. You cannot ignore the, 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 just the, the, the troubled sort of tussle over land in that place, which literally unfolds as you walk from one neighborhood to the other. So within like a, half a kilometer radius, you'll see how the, the texture of the city changes. And going to a place which is like the, the older part of the city, which is the space which is holy for Christians, for Muslims, for mm. Jews, it's the most sort of conflicted piece of land, religious land, etc., which is under such heavy security and Things are outlawed that you're not supposed to collect in front of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. If you're in, like, in a group larger than four people, you're not supposed to even, like lots of people want to go get married over there. You're not supposed to do that. So people actually have gonzo style weddings where they pretend that they're just hanging out with their friends and there's a priest who's not dressed as a priest reading the vows and it's all done gonzo style. So it's, it's things like this that, yeah, but like, it, how do you how do you bring these stories out? How do you bring out the fact that this is this place fraught with so much, and yet there is so much that you want to experience when you're there? So it's a small thing. It was almost like walking in that area. You saw the cats. There's a place which is full of cats. It's an old city, tons and tons of cats. So people, their movements are restricted. They can't walk from one place to the other without being patted down, checked by guards. They, you know, if they hang around too much in front of one door, they'll be told to move away, etc. But here is a city where the cats are moving in and out freely from one zone to the other. And it was a really like, you know, it's a photograph of like this cat in front of the Alaksa Mosque, this cat in front of like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And this cat in front of the wailing wall. And it's, it's just a nice picture, contrast, yeah. a small detail that adds something to your story, which is really sort of fun. It's another thing. You just, you listen to people around you, whether you're actually having a conversation with them or you're listening to people talking around you. Mm. And sometimes you find the nicest story. So I remember I was part of like a, like a guided tour with somebody who was very, very Jewish and very proud of her Jewish identity. And in Jerusalem, it's a constant process of, you know, making history as you sort of, you know, as you're going about it, like the, the, the connection to the land has to be established for whichever community yeah. is there to establish that uh, sort of link to the land. So yeah, my Jewish guide was very much about like a, uh, historical references from the Bible and that's what proves that we have like the original connection with the land etc. Yeah. But it was really interesting so following her to this one place which was right the, the area which is right under the wall um, I was walking behind her and she, she was giving some like whatever some historical reference and all which was fine but like you know I lost interest after a while because it was her version of history and it was a very yeah. not so yeah not so neutral version though history is not neutral but uh, it was a very, very biased version of history. So while I was walking behind her, I saw this, this bride. I mean, she was dressed in a, like a, like a bridal gown and she was, she was also walking in those tunnels and she was followed by like a, what looked like her bridesmaids and a mother and all of that. Mm. And just following them. I mean, then I stopped following my guide and I started following their train of people instead. Yeah. And I saw that they went one part of that those tunnels which was really right under the the wall which was the like the original sort of monument used to be there hmm. so that's where they go and then i see them they all stop below that section of the wall is just a tunnel with like a like a like an old wall in front of them but yeah. the wall has little niches in them and they all leave I saw like there were little notes left in those the, those niches and this woman also left a little note there and then I realized later, somebody else was talking about it, that all young brides, because they can't actually go to the, the mosque, which is where the, apparently the, the original Jewish temple was, they, all they can do is go below and leave these little notes because that is that, it's the only remnant of that, that holy mm. place that was once theirs, whatever was theirs or not theirs, is, is a subject of dispute. But that little note, that bride dressed as a bride, wearing sneakers because it is like, not a very easy path to navigate. 
I think these are these are the little stories that sort of make a place come alive. And it's these stories that come to you when you're walking. It's when you're walking a city, sometimes without a map, sometimes without purpose, just walking and taking it all in. Taking it all in as it is. It's similarly in this place, again, streets which have not changed very much from the 14th century or the 15th century. You see mm-hmm. these girls, I saw like caravan of men dressed. They were actually not monks, but they were dressed as monks because they were going for some parade. And you really could be transported back to another era. It's just like, it's just these little, little, little details. It's again, walking down a shop and I mean, walking down a, a street and crossing all these shops and one shopkeeper after the next, after the next, either notices your Indian or whatever, figures your yeah. Indian, etc. And calls you in, but instead of actually calling you in to ask you, like, do you want to buy this or whatever, sings a Raj Kapoor song to you. So it was lovely. Like, so it was, I mean, these things are sort of nice things to remember. And they're not just incidents that happen to you that you don't include into your piece. I mean, I think including these little bits into your piece really make a difference. And that's, that's what, I mean, that's what, I think good travel writing is that that is the kind of travel writing I would want to read, which would tell me the details, which would tell me about the the person who's in this place, their observations and their interactions mm. with that place. That is what makes that city come alive, not the just the facts and figures and and the the square feet or, or the, the grand feet. outpouring of feelings. I felt this, then I felt that, or then I felt this, and then I felt no, that. No, no, no. That is also that. that is terribly self indulgent. But to be yeah. able to tell you about a monument's history. Through hmm. certain observations which are beyond just the facts. Right. Those are things that bring that place alive. And those are things that also help you remember. Like some of the greatest travel writers have written like that. I was reading not too long back. I was reading, actually during this lockdown, I was reading Teju Cole's Open City. Teju Cole? Perfect, is, yeah. is that an Indian writer? No, no, no. Teju Cole's an American writer. And he's, okay. he's off, he lives in America and he's, he's of Nigerian origin. And... Uh, He's of Nigerian origin, I think. We checked that. But uh, yeah, so I was reading his book and it was a perfect time to read it because here you were stuck in a lockdown. Not This was like the, the toughest period of the lockdown when you're not allowed to leave your house at all for any reason apart from like right. essential essentials and <clears throat> medical supplies, etc. Right. So that in the middle of all of that, you're reading this book about this guy whose story is about walking cities. It's walking down the streets of New York, walking through its various lanes, his observations about people, his observations about himself as a man of color, navigating that place, yet not feeling like he belongs to a larger American colored populace either because he's he's not American. Hmm. So his, it's, his, it's his very particular interactions with the city that bring the, and his observations about a certain monument, about a certain bartender that he meets at this random bar near the, near ground zero. It's all these little, little details that suddenly bring New York alive. And it's like, you know, in all its parks and all its like little terrible bits and all the, the, the violence, the mayhem, the food, it yeah. all comes alive. And it's through one person's story. It's that one person's interactions with the city. But those interactions don't leave out a larger history. They don't leave mm. out a larger political sort of narrative, a framework within which that city functions, exists on a day-to-day basis. But uh, yeah, it's his observations that sort of draw you into that place. And I think that that really is what, yeah, that really is what uh, one has learned over the years about what makes travel writing interesting or engaging. Wow. So, and I worked with very separate travel magazines in my career. Mm. So I worked with uh, my first job at a travel magazine was at National Geographic Traveler. And uh, now I work with Condé Nast Traveler. They're two magazines with very different approaches to travel with a very different sort of uh, aesthetic for that matter. But uh, this part still holds true about having that different perspective about a place and always telling that story because we've written sometimes in simultaneously like the, you know, like consecutive issues we've written um, about the same place. Sometimes it's like a mm. story about Bombay and another story about Bombay. Like, yeah. But 
from two entirely different perspectives. Like one's a, a beautiful essay, which is very poetic about like the rains in Bombay and somebody growing up in Bombay and experiencing and interacting and engaging with those rains and the city and how it changes during that time. And another essay, which is really about coming to a city and finding in these little pockets, these little neighborhoods, which are entirely self-contained worlds, basically. Like mm-hmm. each neighborhood is its own world, whether it's Kandivali, whether it's Bandra, whether it is Kolaba, whether it is, I don't know, like Persova. But there are all these like different worlds, different communities contained within within those neighborhoods. And each mm-hmm. of them has their own language, their own food, their own culture. There are all these separate, they actually are. It feels like these little separate islands that make up a whole city. And yet you move so easily from between one and the other. So it, it is, it, it always boils down to that. Same places over and over again, told by different people, but different stories. Yeah, I was, I was reading your article about the five books that sort of redefine or you, you can discover Delhi through, right? And I have lived in a satellite city right next to Delhi for 18 years of my life. Faridabad, right? And so I... Sorry? Absolutely. Please go ahead. So um, as as I was... I picked up City of Jinns at an airport. And this was a time when Dalrymple's Anarchy was rather more famous. But I picked it up and I was was flying from... um, Delhi to Mumbai at that time. And while I was in Mumbai, in my first few days in Mumbai... I was reading this book and I had intense moments of, I have crossed that specific neighborhood so many times, but I had no idea this, this layer of history existed beneath it. And so lo and behold, in, in the winter, I went to Delhi and I found this uh, project called Project Dastan and they had William Dalrymple giving a curated tour of, uh, you know, Mehroli's forts. And I saw, and I, and I went there and, and I saw him narrating it. And, and suddenly I had this, like I had the I had the hair rise at the nape of my neck where I thought I have been so blind this entire time to uh, I, I could not see I saw Delhi as as you know it's South Delhi malls old Delhi with its charms that every photographer who learns uh, some photography goes there and clicks a picture of like some 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 Muslim chacha and then that's that's you know that's that but I saw all these stories emerging from it and I couldn't help but but have like almost this fanatic notion of trying to find the stories that that are uh, hidden in my own city because I feel like you know this sort of like sense of duty to chronicle w- what I've lived in uh, just sort of welled up in within me when I saw Dalrymple who's by the way not even a, a native of Delhi see it through such 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 a divine lens and then have it and then 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 you know half travelogue half you know memoir that sort of thing and and talk about the city um, through through the lens of all of these different people that he interacts with. And I'm like, what would I have to do? What would I have to let go of to really start doing that? And that's what I sort of, sort of want to drive at. There is clearly um, a set of rose tinted glasses through which we view the world. Um, and, and, you know, when, we really, when you really venture out to seek the truth, uh, things can surprise you. And, you, you know, you're, like you said yourself with your experience of the telegraph, certain myths can be caused in a way that's unpleasant. So when you go out looking for stories, interacting with people, what are some of the things you keep in mind? How do you keep an open mind is, is, is really my question. So that's a process of uh, actually, that's a process of learning. It definitely is because hmm. we leave our homes to see the world and that's because you're curious about the world. You want to know more about the world. But you carry, sometimes you carry so much of your home with you that you're not able to, you know, like lose those walls to be able mm. to actually see what exists outside. And to be able to immerse yourself in another culture, to immerse yourself in food. In fact, it's a piece I'm, I'm working on right now. And it's a bit hard to be able to put that piece together because it's through several anecdotes. But the aim of that piece is actually to say exactly this, that how do you, how do you really become a traveler? Becoming a traveler is not just about checking boxes or, you know, Mm. uh, that I have seen X and Y and Z in this store, this place. I have visited all these museums and all the top sites and all of that. 
is it really all of that or is it to be able to have that conversation with somebody who is just somebody on the street somebody you meet in a bar hmm. to be able to have that conversation and listen and let go of your own prejudices biases and really listen to what it is that they are saying hmm. similarly it is with food which is a big this is like you know the segment of food which is a big big window into mm. different places different worlds it's a terrible example to give but it's it's one of those things where you know people when they travel especially a lot of uh, i mean it won't, it's not only about our country but like a lot of americans when they travel will stick to eating american food on their package tours as with like you know a lot of like indians and package tours who will eat yeah in food uh the point is that you cannot lose those certain inhibitions to be able to really engage with that world outside if you are going and carrying your food to another place you have not eaten what exists out there you have not engaged with where their how their culture history their migrations their changing sort of circumstances their changing food habits how they reflect and what they eat today you will not have understood those people unless you have been able to eat their food it might be very different from yours it might not even be familiar it might not even be pleasant to your palate sometimes mm. it's why you certain things as you know exotic or strange or yeah rank level. but that idea of of what is exotic of what is strange is because we are always looking at it from the perspective of what we know and if we don't let go of that then how are you going to be able to experience the new how are you going to be able to even begin to appreciate where it comes from or understand where it comes from and therefore write about it with some semblance of that curiosity to be able to make somebody else curious about it in the first place mm. i mean like look at the great food writers journalists presenters whatever you'd call him anthony yeah. bourdain love him his ability lay in the fact that he could he could be wherever he was with that idea that i don't know anything like i know nothing mm. but i'm willing to immerse myself in this place and to know more and to eat anything so that really is it takes a lot to get to that point i remember going to places very early on in my travels like going to thailand and other parts of southeast asia and sometimes the the street food you interact with is is quite different it might even be like you know like strange parts of an animal like strange bits of offal mm. insects etc etc or yeah, which a great different. whatsapp messages for elders in india yeah. Yeah. point is that it is very it is alien to us but what's to say that our food is not alien to them when i went there for the first time not knowing better i was even i was squeamish about it and i was like you know what what is this and obviously i can't bring myself to eat that hmm. it's only later traveling more understanding more reading more being really uncomfortable by this idea of othering another person's food another person's culture in the writing of it that one became more sensitive towards that and with that came the thing that just for the sake of trying it out you might not like it so you might not eat it a second time but eat mm. it once see what it's like and that really was a wonderfully sort of freeing experience because after that i had no qualms honestly apart from the fact that i wouldn't eat something that was really entirely like went against my certain notions of like okay this is like endangered species and this is mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. Really- like this terribly expensive exploitative crop right. and something like that outside of that or it's really cruel outside of that i was like there is nothing that i i wouldn't eat actually. yeah and that is quite uh, quite freeing in a way because that enables you to really engage with another place which is very different from yours and i think in therein lies this idea of what do you have to keep in mind is really that idea of keeping that open mind is a constant learning experience to let go of your prejudice let let your biases biases not show when mm. you are out there on the road let them not show because you will be the poorer for it you're never going to come back with much if 
it is home you're looking for everywhere mm. that's 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 poetic as fuck i um i you know i did, there is this one notion that i often saw indians carry out again and again when i went to when I, my parents loved traveling abroad and and the way we curated our trips was through were through uh, travel providers such as thomas cook and cox and things when we were kids what often happens when you travel and and you see the city through the lens of a travel operator right uh, and that's solely what you see it through you get um packaged lunch boxes full of indian cuisines in indian foods right you have a tight itinerary where whatever interactions whatever free roaming time as they call in video games you have happen within the vicinity of do ghante mein bus chali jayegi so you should do you know whatever you want before that and so in in that sort of chaotic but controlled uh, traveling i came back from all these places as a kid but and i used to write as a kid as well but i couldn't really remember something of of great repute or something that le- led, left me with a sense of awe because i was seeing these places through the lens of the travel operator and once i grew up and I, you know I, i went to a couple of places in india on my own solo travel met with different populations of different places uh broke both roti and bone with the same sort of uh uh happiness right. in different places right uh, and then finally when i went to boston for college i noticed this still that that the kids of those parents who were who went abroad in these in these uh sort of curated packages they were still the same kids who would refuse to even engage with uh like let's say you know like whatever is famous in boston like cod is right pretty famous clam clam chowder is famous they wouldn't even engage with yeah. that right instead choosing to um and there's nothing wrong with going to indian restaurants but almost forming like a it's like you migrated abroad with your clique and you refused to go outside the confines of that clique so in four years of college all you learn about is the lives of other indians and i found that extremely disheartening because in the process of those four years i made friends from more than 10 to 15 countries and all of them brought their own experiences to the table absolutely i mean and that is the same thing it, it is that thing of you know that chance conversation with a stranger mm. at a bar is just somebody you meet who's from an entirely different place from where you are but it's that openness to have that conversation to not be wary of that of course be careful when you're traveling but to not right. always be exposed to that chance encounter and that chance conversation which can then take you to so many places either it can tell you about like something that you had no idea about that person mm. can tell you about that little hidden away cafe somewhere that no guide book is going to tell you about or yeah. they're going to tell you about like some like very priceless bit of like information in terms of like an a wonderful anecdote about a like a place you have again is a very famous place but an anecdote that you wouldn't again find in books because this comes from this person living in this place having grown up in this place having a certain insight and just having walked those roads yeah. for his whole life so it's it's these it's to be open i think to these sort of chance encounters which can really be your story it can be the way that you find your story it's not that you figure out that okay this show you when you're traveling to a place you know that i'm going to interact with a historian b uh chef c person who's an expert and maybe i don't know local craft or local hmm. art these are the people who are going to give me a certain perspective of the city which is an expert's perspective which is great you need that information hmm. as well but apart from those it is sometimes just the very ordinary person your guy who's driving your cab who might be like a a migrant from wherever like from afghanistan yeah. or from i can attest to that yeah and the stories they'll tell you about driving around in that city the people they've met how they've come to that place their interactions mm-hmm. where they eat those are the stories that really like they add to that other narrative of the experts they add to the other bits of history that you've read in the books all it's the coming together of all of these things that really makes that good story and then of course it is your own observations while you're there i think mm-hmm. it is it can't just be like i said you you again i go back to that thing where you said is it throwing out of your whim it can't be that it can't be mm-hmm. just my whim in the universe floating about and i'm writing because i'm not writing 
a piece of fiction. I am mm. writing about a place which is very real, which has a very real context, a very real history. So it has to be a coming together of all of these things to be able to truly tell the story of that place, essentially. And and so, yeah, when you are out and about in these places, are you are you stopping everywhere and taking notes wherever you can, like Jack Kerouac does on every single tissue paper, or are you, or are you are you doing that well, from memory? Are you stopping? When no, you're of course not. You yeah. can't do that from memory. What I do is take a lot of photographs on my phone of everything, like everything that catches my eye, catches my interest. I take videos, I take photographs, tons and tons of photographs, especially of details that I remember. I remember there was one. And especially to remind me sometimes. And of course, I write down things. I take notes, but I take those mm. notes on my phone now. Okay. I don't write them on pieces of tissue paper or on whatever, those scraps of like tickets because it's just more practical to yeah. write them yeah. on your phone. Or I have voice notes as well of things that again, strike me. I keep those as well. But uh, one of the things that you remember is like an impression which which crosses your mind at that point. You're not writing at that point, right? When you're out on the field, either reporting or, or, or traveling or whatever. You're not really writing your piece at that point. It's only later when you're back, a couple of weeks later, that you collect all of that information together, you process mm. it, and then that's when you write it down. But, so if there's an impression... Sorry, I just have one work. more question. And so do you, do you do calls slash research after that as well? Because memory isn't such a great, great no, tool. So apart from all of this, like especially for a piece which is reported, hmm. if there are there are extensive interviews as well. So there are all of those things, right? So travel hmm. writing is very different. My earlier avatar as a food food writer for uh, when I was with Mint Lounge hmm. was a lot of reporting. So that obviously follows the the traditional trajectory of hours and hours and hours of interviews with people that you transcribe. Hmm. And of course, if there are some gaps remaining over there, then you do make follow-up calls to to fill in those gaps. But essentially, when you're out, again, reporting, it's just tons of interviews that you're doing at all points of time, taking those photographs, making those notes, collecting other documents that support your story, hmm. doing other research about facts, figures, all of that. All of that also plays a big role in it. These are different kinds of writing. So in my different jobs, I've also done different kinds of feature writing. So when I was with Mint Lounge, that was uh, very reported pieces. So it was not like the life of a travel writer where you travel to places and you can write about it in a more sort of meditative, hmm. personal, observation-based manner. Though right. there are inputs from three people, there are interviews in that case as well. But with a newspaper, it is much more... Uh, how to put it like it's it's much more journalistic in its sense where it is based on very real interviews very real facts and figures uh the business of things as well as the the cultural side of things so it's it's, right. it's a coming together all of those things so for each bit you need to write differently you need to uh collect your information differently as well huh. so even for, for mint lounge if i go back to the story there I was doing the story about uh Single origin chocolate, which is a the the new chocolate revolution in India. Where, yeah, seventy you know, percent cacao available at God yeah, Naturals, that sort of Kerala thing. And farmers in Kerala and all around uh, the Malabar coast, as well as in in parts of I think Andhra and all, they are growing wonderful, wonderful uh, cocoa beans, and uh, they are there are these small, very very, uh, how do I put it? very conscientious craft chocolate makers, you know, who work directly with these farmers, give them, offer them that fair price, work with like mm. the, the ways they grow their chocolate, etc. So contributing obviously to their overall, I mean, this uh, chocolate is a very, it's a very easy, cocoa bean is an easy to grow sort of crop. It's not something that requires extensive uh, caring for in that sense it just grows mm. on its own they just need to harvest it when it's done and maybe like do a little bit of pruning and proofing from pests and other diseases so the thing is that it benefits them because there is a potentially growing chocolate market in india so it, yeah. it benefits in a big way so it's it's an additional crop to their main crops which is paddy or whatever other more regular large-scale cash crops so when I was there, but to go back to this, I was not going to talk about the farmers and their uh, the, the what they were getting from the chocolate farms, but it was more about 
uh, writing about that, even where that was a lot about interviews, it was about going to these farms and different places, meeting like uh, people from the local panchayat, meeting people who were uh, these fair trade organizations who were working with the farmers, trying to do away with the middlemen, get them better mm-hmm. prices, etc. So apart from interviewing all of them, I remember it was in this lovely, lovely village. It was in Iduki, which is like an it's in Kerala. Beautiful part of Kerala, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was during the rains, and uh, just the previous year, it had been terribly devastated by the floods. And uh, going to that place, you sort of you know saw like how their crops had been destroyed, parts of their farmland had washed away. We walked to, I mean, a lot of these places are like, again, not non-motorable roads. To get to those farms, you have to walk a fair bit. And bridges had been washed away and traces of all of that were still there. And it was raining when we were walking. And it's, the rains are, are very, very, like, it's very different. I don't know how to explain it to you, but it, it's, you're literally walking through a forested area the hmm. rains carry the memories of not just, it's not just beautiful because you are seeing this like destroyed bridge in front of you and it, it carries the memory of the rains of the year past, which might right now might look all wonderfully romantic and feathery and beautiful and sound lovely. Hmm. But it really is also really just that memory of exactly what happened in that state just such a short while ago and the fact that it's nobody's recovered from it yet. Hmm. So it was... It's just that impression of like a broken bridge, that part of that river which flows over it, that image that I wanted to keep because I know I wanted to go back to it later. And so, you know, I remember taking photographs of that and taking like a video of that that place, following this person who was talking about exactly what that area had gone through, what devastation had happened. So it's these little sort of notes that you keep. Then another place, again, in Iruki itself, it was like how the excessive rains had caused a lot of damage to the cocoa beans and they sort of fall off the trees and they they, they basically they just like they die they they, yeah. they have this pest or whatever there's a particular pest that's caused by excessive moisture and that kills the <clears throat> the beans and the plant also eventually so that particular tree had a a pile of these desiccated cocoa beans and they'd all turned black with moisture and it was just a pile of them under this very lush green tree. And it was a black pile which looked like it had been burnt. And it almost looked like like these skeletal sort of, you know, like it was a very, very startling image. Right. And out of one of those desiccated cocoa beans, there was like a spider crawling out. And it was a really, really, like it was a really powerful That's image. crazy. So it was like, you know, like how do you remember this later? Your memory will change. Your that impression that you have right then will change. So you really hope that you remember exactly what you felt when you're looking at it. Try to capture it in the best way possible through a photograph, a video, a note of what mm. it is that you are seeing right now and hope you mm. can write about it later. And, so yeah, and that eventually. Yeah. How many times do you typically rewrite something? Because I know various writers, at least I know the ones from fiction have absurd policies. I know Chuck... Polonik, I'm, I hope I'm saying his name right. I'm reading his book, um, Survivor. And he he said in an interview that he rewrites 100 times before he sends it to, to his publisher, which I think is a bit much. Um, and then David Sidara is another writer, favorite writer of mine. He writes around 20, 20 rewrites. And then, so it's, it's really, because what you're doing typically is you're producing for an online audience and also like a print audience that, that reads magazines. Have that luxury of time to be able to rewrite your piece a hundred times because sometimes yeah. you're working on deadlines where you're burning the midnight oil mm-hmm. just to write, especially if it's a long form pe- feature of about like 3,000, 4,000 words, and you have like literally 48 hours to turn it around, or you do yeah. not have the luxury of uh, rewriting it a hundred times. So, how do so you do it? Often, so, what you do is you keep writing at what? editing while you're writing, writing everything that you have to write, which is probably maybe 10,000 words and then slashing it down and keeping the essential bits in it. Then of course, there are other people who edit your piece. So you Isn't it weird that you're all, you're an editor and you have, you can't edit your own pieces? No, but you can't edit your own pieces. You need someone which, who has more distance and perspective to be able to edit you. You can edit pieces to a point, Okay. but there are some, some points, somebody else has to look at it from the outside to be able to tell you that, what you have been holding on to and what is your like 
like your baby you got to yeah. kill it now yeah so more your darling yeah yeah it does not sound as lovely as it sounds in your head and it's entirely irrelevant to your piece no matter how beautiful that flourish of language is right you got to leave it out so you need somebody with that distance and perspective to be able to tell you that and that's where the i mean an importance of a really good editor is um, I, mean, i can't stress on how important that is so yeah. just for some give your piece direction and make it better and uh, one i guess needs to be able to if if your editor tells you that you know this is not working this particular section is not connecting well this bit is disjointed rewrite it rewrite it of course rewrite it completely have that i mean you got to being especially being a writer for a newspaper a magazine or any of that you've got to have a fair bit of humility you have to be mm. proud of what you write stick to your point stick to your arguments but also have a certain amount of humility to be able to let go of your piece in a certain way where you can return to it hmm. with the perspective that somebody else has added to it because the end the objective of it at the end of it is to come out with a better piece so actually yeah. to be able to work with that to be able to you do an edit right at the beginning but then you also rely on other people giving you that feedback to make your writing better to make your piece better to make your story stronger hmm. that's And always I- this wonderfully it's a, it's the same thing as editors you bring to another person's piece because the objective is to be able to work with a writer i i do both things right yeah so i, I was going to get to that yeah edit other people's pieces so the objective is to work really closely with the writer and that should be this that relationship between the editor and writer should be that where you have the same objective to make this a better story so that hmm. is the ultimate goal whether that involves like rewriting your piece taking out bits inserting bits doing whatever it takes that's the ultimate aim and therefore you've just got to push pull work with it and come up with that you know like sort of achieve that final objective hmm. and and so do you ever experiment or do you decide to experiment with with writing that extends beyond uh lifestyle and website uh lifestyle writing or websites have you ever tried your hand at say social media writing or writing fiction well fiction is the the long standing dream as i said one always flitted about this world to be a writer and hopefully mm. that will come to pass some day yeah. but it's a it's a it sometimes it's a tricky proposition when you have a full time job to be able to if i say i want to write a book i can keep saying i want to write a book but uh, hmm. i my full time job is dealing with words they yeah. are my bread and butter they earn me my living so it's very hard to sort of switch off from that from my deadlines to be able to get back to writing but yeah, anyway that is that is the hope mm-hmm. but in terms of actually writing fiction or writing something else yes i have written stuff but that's mostly like still in my in the realm of for private consumption i see i had written an earlier avatar which was whatever you know like young people's aspirations of poetry or blank verse or whatever poetic prose however one would call it yeah i've written all those things but yeah one hopes that uh, at an older age one will write uh, Yeah. Better. Yeah, I can't stand Instagram poets. I used to be one myself, but I, I at least have I'm too old for that to be an Instagram yeah. poet. I don't belong to that generation where I'm going to be the the yeah. social media uh, sensation. So that's not unlikely. Yeah, it's but, it's a weird thing, right? Cuz I mean, this is sort of what I struggle with is is this idea of uh, well, you can either you can work on your craft in isolation or you can work you can upload it publish it with mistakes and let the audience give you feedback and you get better there's completely two different styles and that's sort of the reason why I also wanted to get you on to um you know but you know the thing yeah. is that i also do feel that it's it's also a wonderful new medium to be able mm. to expand with like i don't think that everyone who just uploads like the, the not all instagram poets are firstly rubbish there's a lot of like interesting work that's going on now there's a lot of there are so many you know one of the things that you talk about like writing for just print or web and any of that we are now becoming people who write in a manner which is sort of medium agnostic so mm. even if you do write 
say it's an Instagram post. Like I was working on something which was actually a video for a for a. It was a video for Karnanas Traveler. It was something right. about uh, um, getting people to remember what it felt like to go to restaurants now, after four months in lockdown. That's something that feels like a different you know world mm-hmm. and a lifetime. So I'd uh, written the script for that and somebody else had made the video and the two came together really well. The music was nice. The thing is that, and it was up on Instagram, etc. The thing is that you're still conveying that message. You're still conveying that story. It's a, it's a very, not specific, specific to this, but it's a pretty powerful story that you can tell through the intermingling of these different sort of media, mm-hmm. essentially. And even as somebody who, I mean, I came of age at the time when the internet sort of came into India and we were the people who had lived a life before the internet and yeah. then were also the, we, we were also the early adopters in that sense. We yeah. grew in that world very easily. We yeah. took were, to you that on, world were you on Yahoo chat rooms back in the day? When, when that, oh, that was yeah, that was of all of that because when that came in, it was this like, wildly exciting new world a way to connect with people you didn't know beyond your limited social circles and there really was a lot that sort of changed in terms of the world coming into your living room and you being able to explore worlds that you had no access to before so Mm. similarly now with writing I feel it's the same thing that you can you can tell your story whether it's in like what is it? 240? 180? How many characters? Are yeah, there? Twitter is, I think, 240 now. Yeah, so it's 200, yeah. whether it's 240 characters on Twitter, I'm not very active on Twitter, but I, yeah, but what I'm trying to say is that you can say something which is very powerful on that. You can tell a wonderful, like a 180 word little story on Instagram. There are all these wonderful, those, you know, those terribly tiny tales that yeah, are told yeah. through. They're, they're really words. successful, yep. Yeah. They are lovely. And then there are these little like horror movie versions of that. There are funny mm. versions of that. There is a modern love equivalent, which is again told in just 180 words. And they're all so powerful. So, I mean, it's it's it entirely almost Luddite to say that, oh my God, like, you know, we will valorize print and print is the only way in which you can tell yeah. stories or that long form is the only form in which you can convey what it is that you want to convey. That's not true at all, at all. You're what you're writing just keeps changing it's the medium in which it's it's expressed in hmm. but writing still stays the the strength of that still stays you just keep changing and evolving in the way that you're telling that story and for what medium you're telling it so all the people i have worked in publishing at a time when they just started in india they just started looking at uh, ebooks for the first time hmm. and there was a lot of uh, natural sort of uh, ang- um, angst is not the right word, but people were sort of troubled about whether that would mean the, you know, the end of print or the death of yeah, print. Yeah. I had Chiki Sarkar on from Juggernaut Books who talked a fair bit about that as well. Yeah. So, you know, the thing is that whether, you know, that would sound a death knell for the printed books because printed books were still entirely the money spinners. Nobody had figured out how to work the, the ebook market, whether people would buy, whether they would pay money and all of that. That was what, 2009, 10? Actually, that was 2000 and probably 2008 or 9. 2009. Right. No, mm-hmm. actually late. 2010 or 11. Back to 10 years later now, everybody's buying ebooks right now. People are not going to bookstores. You have access to ebooks. People have access to Kindles. That's why, I mean, right now, Currently, in the middle of a pandemic, there are like ebook sales have shot up. The books are being launched as just ebooks alone rather than the physical copies because they don't make sense to like launch a physical yeah. copy anymore mm-hmm. right now. So the point is that it's not that it's going to sound a death knell for the printed books, or even if it does, even if it does, does that mean it's the end of books? Does that mean it's the end of writing? Does that mean it's the end of writers? When the early in the early 15th century, 15th century, yeah, Gutenberg, 15th century, when they first moved from your illuminated scrolls to the printed book, people thought this was sacrilege, like knowledge was going to escape the hands of these few people who had control over it, the the monasteries who used those scrolls. And 
it would go into the hands of the people and then all hell would break loose. But what did that happen? It democratized knowledge. More people got to read. More people took to writing. It just made it more accessible. And that's the same thing with like whether you're writing for the web, whether you're writing on Instagram, whether you're writing on any of these other social media platforms that essentially mm. you're just probably bringing your writing closer to many more people. 5,000 people, 10,000 people, maybe a lakh subscribe to a magazine, mm. right? Like depending on the size of the magazine circulation, etc. Maybe it's a lakh, maybe it's even five lakhs. What is five lakhs in a country? 1.2 billion people. Sure, 1.2 billion people don't have access to Instagram and all of that. Mm. But it's a very large chunk. I don't know what those numbers are, but it's definitely above like 200 million that like is on WhatsApp that will read a forward that's sent to you. Yeah. An article that is created in a particular format and sent out on WhatsApp will reach that many people. Yes. So, I mean, it's just like, there is so much potential and there's so much scope for more people to read what it is that you want to say. So yeah. I think it's actually, yeah, I was having a conversation with my grandfather and he was, he was ruining the fact that he could not decipher the source of the WhatsApp forward because he wanted to meet the author or like cross question him about certain things. And I thought that that was remarkable as, as a man who, who grew up sort of reading books and, and um, you know, like hearing stories uh, that, usually had an author he was he was pissed off about the fact that he would he was getting all this information and he was reading through it but he couldn't find an author so that he could challenge him and say that you know your claims are yeah. wrong so there's so always, there is, you know see there is that flip side of it it is it is therefore the medium which is open to everybody so it is right. open to every right so right, you right, can right. Therefore use it in many ways appropriate yeah. it for your own ends mm. but that doesn't take away from the fact that there is a lot that you can do with it that mm. is very, 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 very positive in fact. Mm. So. Yeah, the, I want to take a s s sl uh, slight segue and talk to you about like uh, sort of finding your writing voice. Um, I've often found writing assignments to be particularly boring, but I, I do understand that there is a merit because it forces you to think beyond what your natural proclivities are, right? It forces you to argue logically at least. Um, you've been writing for, you know, I'd say over a decade or even more, right? How did you go about finding that this is my style? This is the way I write. This is not strunk or wide. This is not some whimsical rambling. This is exactly the way I write. How did you arrive at that? Did you refer to some journalism schools? Did you emulate your favorite authors? How did you go about that? No, I mean, you know, that is really a very difficult question because that's still work in progress. Mm. It's a constant work in progress to find your voice, to be able to say what it is that you want to say with conviction, to be able mm. to sit in your own voice, not emulating the people you have loved reading. Right. To be able to sit in your own voice, not being influenced by people that you admire, other journalists, uh, friends that you have long conversations with about writing, about like topics that are you know common between you. Mm. How do you not emulate that to the point where you lose your own voice? Mm. It is it's a constant struggle, and it's with every piece you come a little closer to it with some pieces you move away from it hmm. so it's it's not something that i would say that i have arrived at for sure no i still definitely think it's work in progress and it's something that keeps evolving the more one dives into the field that they're focusing on the more one learns more about it the more one crystallizes, I think, those ideas in your head as to this is what you really want to say. Hmm. And to be able to say it as you, hmm. not as that person you've been reading, those five books you've been reading as reference, you shouldn't be sounding like them. Yeah. But you should be able to take away from what it is that you've read from them to come up hmm. with your own premise, essentially, and to come up with your way of saying that story. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, I think work in progress, I'm very, very impressed by and always in awe of people who have got this down pat right from the beginning. Hmm. But for me, I would say I'm still learning. And I think uh, this is going to be learning for quite a long time. Yeah, but I, I think I think that process is, is process is rewarding irrespective of whatever stage you're on. Um, I often think of what 
sort of books or influences does one have that that leads them to the sort of place that you're at right writing and and then editing for content as traveler are there and i know this is a loaded question because when you ask people what are your five favorite books that have changed your life they're like oh my god and i can't so many. i can't answer those questions yeah, at yeah. all that, yeah. that's why i want to that's why i want to reframe this a slightly different in a slightly different way for someone who's looking to even start uh traveling because a fair bit of what we focused on was was traveling and then writing about our observations what books would you generally recommend and, I, and i'll start off i recently read in patagonia by bruce chatwin which i think is fantastic but it's slightly prosaic it was sort of hard to grasp all these locations and and every page every chapter is a, a day spent with someone else and then there's also you know city of gins i like g tile even though he's not exactly a tri- travel writer so i've done what i can as a layman uh, to lay out yeah, my but, yeah you know there is there is so much there are all these like bruce chat when there is so many there are so many people like your bill brysons everybody there's paul theru there's there's like pico ayer there are all there are all these like you know dream travel writers who everybody knows are like the travel writers you want to someday be like etc hmm. but i don't know if i can tell you that go read Bruce Chatwin or go read even Pico Ayer for that I mean of course go read these people they are like great so you should read them yeah but the point is that is there a bible that you should refer to is there a book you should read to become a travel writer uh or will that help you become a travel writer no i mean definitely read those books because the more you read maybe you will get more insights to become a better writer but sometimes it's not really travel writing that makes you want to see a place sometimes it can be something as simple as a work of fiction so uh-huh. for me that's that's actually something that's been the 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 impetus sometimes to travel has been a book that i've read which is actually a work of fiction entirely so it could be George Orwell writing about uh, being down and out in Paris and London that makes me want to read about Paris it hmm. obviously movable piece that makes me want to read about Paris it's or green hills for africa for that matter that's also okay. green hills of africa by hemingway the same ah, yeah ah, it's about and what it could yeah. be like you know like when i was in cairo it was nagi mehfooz and his works that you would you know look at before going to that place so often before traveling it is a book about that place that i read which which features that book in some sort of way it was like before i went to delhi i read city of jins before i came to bombay i read maximum city these are the books that i want to read to have a context to that city that's what brings hmm. that city when i walk the streets these are the stories i hear those stories yeah. of of that of that place they really come alive there are it's not some it's sometimes it's not even books alone it's movies you watch a yeah. movie about that before you go there so you already in that place in your imagination before you actually travel to that place and that i think is what works really well it's what you what will take you to that place i think before you go there yeah you know that's crazy i never thought that there was a process to this i uh, i was obsessed with i don't think there's a process yeah. at all it's not a process that i do consciously it's something that i enjoy doing it gives me mm. a context a place i mean i read that i read those books and watch those films and listen to the music from that place rather than read guide books before going there which might not be the most intelligent move but it's definitely what really makes me want to go to that place because it leaves things to the imagination right because i remember when i was a uh, yeah when i when i was a uh, i was obsessed with 60s hippie music right the whole scene jimi hendrix all of those guys this this name hyde ashbury came up in my oh, imagination again yes. and again and again and again right and so i decided you know i have some money saved up let me go and do this solo trip to san francisco i don't have any extensive thanksgiving plans or anything so right? you read john didion before doing john didion yeah john didion have been have been like totally read that but anyway yeah i was i was half inspired by jack kerouac's on the road and half inspired by the copies video footage uh, videos that i watched of uh, you know woodstock and monterey pop festival all those things and just the forums i read online so it all culminated in me going to hyde ashbury and, and spending a day there and seeing those tropes um, but what happened when i went there is 
is you have this sort of dreamy picture of of what you, you know your yeah. the authors the musicians painted right and then there's san francisco of 2017 right and and so they both mingle and they collide right so so what has happened is the 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 pure the purism of the hippie movement has dissolved down into shops that sell both salvia and like you know uh, fucking gems crystals all of those things and then how jimi the, hendrix more- has become like a like a tour bus you can go into right that that oh, sort of thing of course but that is what is really exciting i mean that is what is really exciting about places about cities the fact that they're constantly evolving so you read this book set in maybe the 60s or the 70s or even an earlier century right and you go to that current day city like i read about like you know cairo or like somebody writing about like a, a pharaoh akhenaten and this wonderful pharaoh writing about him in that that particular period and i go to modern day cairo and it's a city which has your cafes your hipster vegan restaurants but it also has those pyramids it also mm. has like statues of akhenaten it also has his history there it's this wonderful sort of this nimble transition between that old and the new that that exists in that same city that's what makes it so exciting hmm. so that book gives you one context one entry point but it is only one entry point it's a it's a lovely entry point to have for some it's non fiction when i before i went to jerusalem i was reading uh, simon c bag montefiore's wonderful book on jerusalem hmm. where he was talking about you know like the city within the city within the city and that was like you know my starting point for seeing the city below the ground the city above the ground the city that's been created over and over again by historians by archaeologists all of that hmm. so it's it's one entry point whatever that entry point be but it is not the sole entry point and then once you're there you see the other different things and there are all these little little bits that make up that whole pastiche which makes up that city which is that vibrant wonderful city by the way i totally love cities and love writing about cities simply because they have so many layers so many yeah. like you know so many like bits of history simultaneously coexisting and the past and present coming together in this messy wonderful way so i really really do like uh, that about cities more than i like wonderful picturesque uh, beautiful towns yeah. which are nice but they're nice for like one or two days mm. then they start then i start like wanting to see that you know that that grimy messy exciting beautiful sort of you know bits of the city which is all all in the same place yeah i'm i'm just i'm just pining to go and travel once the lockdown ends because i did take a class in college uh, called middle eastern cities and it covered i think it was mecca uh and then no no sorry so uh riyadh um the, the beirut riyadh beirut uh, a couple of places in syria like the whole fort al crest and couple of other things and uh, it it took a lens of it 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 showed us the city through uh the rulers the architecture that that was sort of preserved mm-hmm. as those rulers wanting to leave their legacy behind um the the various monuments that that stood through different dynasties then through pop culture right yeah, like uh, there was this famous singer called um kalthum i believe she was egyptian but i could be wrong yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah of course and 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 so and so and i couldn't help but voice sorry she has a fabulous voice i i have you tried to like listen i don't i don't get the i don't get the lyrics but it's certainly in it it has this sort of foreign exoticness that you 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 want to sort of try and complete the puzzle because like you said that whole class gave me one perspective but what was what was missing was the was me being physically in those cities or me meeting people of those cities and then you know basically like you complete a circle and that's the truth and what you already have right now is a piece of that truth like like a piece of the pie where you don't have the entire picture and you only hope you get that the entire pie picture. that is the and the, the reason of something appearing because you mentioned that that foreign exotic sounding thing the whole idea of traveling there knowing that little bit which while you're in your classroom or while you're sitting here you read that one little bit that makes the sound like this wonderful foreign sounding place with music yeah. that's in to your ears and food that comes from some medieval land and spices that you don't know of you travel to remove that notion of the exotic 
Hmm. It should be equally wondrous and wonderful and inspiring, but it shouldn't be like that exotic gem in that store that you look at and you go like, oh my God, that's like so different. It's exotic. It's this weird, curious mirror to what is our familiar. So right. like, that is one of the things one probably as a travel writer has to be most careful about to not how do I put it? To not hew something in that that those wonderful glittering shades of the exotic. Yeah, yeah. I think I think too many. It's too a many, very yeah. real place. It's a very mm-hmm. real place. Very real people with a very different culture, but one that's as similar as yours. You just yeah. like immerse yourself in their land, in their world, in their natural setting, in their geography, in their language, and it's not like exotic anymore. You're absolutely spot on on that because I remember when I was in the US, one of the things I would have to sort of inform and educate my peers about was going beyond the tropes that they had heard about India. I was, you know, the typical land of snake charmers, of mangoes, of young children, of colonial bunglers, of, of sunshine and happiness and all of those things. And, and um, I always made it a point to tell them more than what they thought because I thought of it as a strange land. Um, and then so a couple of them came here and, and they were not they they were at once marveling at how people could drive the like I was showing a couple of friends from Ireland, uh, the city of Delhi, and like I was, I had like a whole day of full of like you know, uh, getting a chalan, uh, <laughs> getting high with them, making them have drinks in like a fancy Delhi bar, and then you know having them walk through Khan Market, going making them see the red fort, like the entire like the whole experience that you can get in in six or seven hours, and by the end they were like. Uh, I think my, my friend got so, he was so done with the overload. Yeah. Yeah. He, and he was also, he was also done with the idea of like wanting to see this city as this, this foreign thing that he's a part of. He started to get it. Like he, he could, he was, he became so good at warding off the people who were trying to sell him something without even knowing the language. And I was like, that's crazy. Like he's just intuitively grasping that it's like, okay, I clearly have to start being a protagonist in this city as opposed to like a passive observer and I see everything through, through my friend's eyes. So you know, that was like an interesting thing to me to see like people physically come to India and then uh, demythologize a certain aspects of, of the country. And that's something that Absolutely. happened to me as well. Again, as a traveler, it's not only about interacting with um, other people about their world. It is about translating your world to them as well. Right. Hmm. So often when, when one is traveling, especially if you're traveling alone, you're asked questions about, your food, the way you dress, the way you speak English. You know, there Mm. there are so many things that you have to translate. Uh, How is it that a Indian is whatever, one type, uh, an Indian they're more familiar with is different from the kind of Indian you represent, is different from the the person you're traveling with who is a different kind of Indian. It's very, uh, since our, our culture is such... It's so, it's not a monoculture essentially, like a yeah. lot of uh, European countries, right? It's so diverse and so spread out and so different in every way, whether linguistically we look different, we eat different foods, we speak differently, we come from different places, we have different varying, I mean, we have varying levels of education, we have all of those things. So it's, it's really hard to translate that we all, even you and me, we all inhabit different Indias and that yeah. there is no India. Yeah. We're, in different, we're in different eras and different places, literally in different cities, within neighborhoods of the same city, we're in different yeah. sort of time frames. So to be able to translate the nuance of that is near impossible at times. And it's sometimes you can only tell them certain things like, give them a small example, like maybe with food, which hmm. is that we don't really eat chicken tikka masala like we're yeah, that happened so many times. That is not <laughs> our national food. Like, yeah, like I eat Bengali food, Punjabi food, food from Kerala. Yeah. I eat pasta when I feel like it. We are so many things that we eat in so many different ways, and that's something you try to explain to them through something they understand, which is the mm-hmm. the coming of migrants into a lot of these places have changed the food habits in places like Europe in a big mm. way right so they are now familiar with say like you know like in i was in when i was in germany 
one hmm. of the things that came across is that like a place which was which only ate like where they ate bratwurst or meat and potatoes and like the terrible sauerkraut and all of that that's all they ate then over the years over the last 50 odd years they started eating turkish food they discovered spices they discovered kebabs they discovered like biryanis pulao's all of those things and they started eating those foods and with through that they understood that like you know their culture gradually changed it incorporated so much else and that becomes a small way in which to tell them how our foods are so different that the kind mm. of spices we use are because of the traders who came in so and so century that a particular kind of food we eat is because of our colonial past a particular kind of like the the clothes we wear the fact that forget about clothes we shouldn't go into that part right now since we're sticking to food hmm. the fact that we also eat like pasta we also eat roasts we also eat like christmas cake in winter hmm. during christmas is because of like the fact that we were ruled by the british for 300 years and we are equally yeah. familiar and well versed in that cuisine as well so it it is through those little inserts that you can try to translate yourself but again unless someone really comes to the country and experiences this mind boggling yeah. diversity that one is still trying to figure out on one's own that you can't really quite translate what it means to be indian and to which india are you representing really yeah it's such a hard question right like the fact that some of us only eat with forks and knives but the, a lot of our country eats with their hands and we also eat with our hands uh, if we are provided with the occasion to do that right and and that simple notion translating that is like why does one part of india do do that and the other part of you not do that that itself involves like 100 conversations about just the way we yeah, every, some of us sit on tables like yeah we speak the language we speak how we speak the clothes we wear why are they so different so it's it's a lot of translating that one needs to do which again is how to put it like for people to really know or understand that they also have to let go of their biases and their prejudices and hmm. move beyond the the white man's perspective of india as this hmm. giant one uniform mass which is all exotic palaces and snake yeah. charmers wine colored days yeah 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 and chicken tikka masala definitely lots that. of it yeah 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 i know it's um, you know the it's it's been it's been such a pleasure talking to you i i uh, i really wish that once this lockdown ends i would love to have a face to face conversation because uh with podcasts with conversations such as this there's something about the 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 screen separation that doesn't allow for those really interesting back and forths that that i personally like at least when it comes to the topics that i uh, enjoy um and you've been such a great conversationalist thank you for that i know what exactly i'm going to do after this podcast is i i figured out a vantage point to observe the city from that i had never seen 18 years of being here i discovered it yesterday because i was cycling again cycling opens up an entire entirely new, new domain to a city that's you know Yes. that you typically drive in it's a driving city right and then walking even more and so through that vantage point i could see the glimpses of single alcoholics in cars by themselves failing marriages um all kinds of small tropes happiness new newly wed couples going for a friday thingy right uh, romances blossoming an entire family going to a village to settle some property dispute all because i sat at this vantage point that no one sits on and i could not be seen and i saw the entire city it's it's the equivalent of visual eavesdropping so i feel like i'm going to do that lovely that's such a lovely story it's like my last i think i will also probably end with that but like one of the pieces i wrote recently probably the last piece that had a like an immediate real world resonance observation based thing because you could still go out then was uh early days of the lockdown i went out for a walk it was just around i live in bandra so it was just around bandra right and i live near the mount mary church which is a very famous church hmm. and uh the mount mary is dedicated to the this particular avatar of mary or whatever she is mary who is supposed to bring uh relief to people suffering from diseases she is supposed to cure heal them and people carry like little models of 
uh, you know, like the, the organs that are uh, failing or mm. if they are suffering from a fever, they carry little dolls of that and they place it at her uh, altar to mm. ask for her blessings to cure their ills. And there's a lot of belief in her, the miracles that, and there's a fair that happens every year and people travel from really far away to, to come to her shrine. And right. it's up on the on a hill that you have to climb up to. So I remember during the early days of the lockdown when I was walking around, it was quite a it was quite a powerful, powerful or one would call it strange thing to walk around this church because of the lockdown which had been instituted. Even this goddess, the patron saint of like savior of people from diseases and you know suffering. Her church was locked. The, the place was deserted. It was never deserted. Her miracles were not going to save anybody. Yeah. The shops outside were empty. People selling those little models and those little icons. They were mm. open, but there was not a soul around. And it was really quite wonderful. Like I heard my fruit wala not too far away talking about Mahamari, the same words that had been used back like when the plague came to Bombay in the 19th century? Mm. 19th century is when the plague hit Bombay. So they were talking about Mahamari and it was Mahamari. It was just the beginning of that. So it was really interesting to see the the, the conversations change in the streets, the, the texture of the streets itself change. Uh, if you go up Mount Mary and go down, you reach Bandstand, which is the haven for young lovers. And you know, yeah, as you wrote in your piece, them. yeah. Yeah, and they'll sit by the rocks and they all sit like one, like right, really close to each other and nobody cares about the other person. And mm -hmm. like romance is like, you know, lived out on this very sort of public realm, but it's perfectly okay. Right. But this time there was nobody there because social distancing, too close, the rocks don't allow for that. But people had found a way. So there were still young couples who were wearing masks, but they had found themselves these other little niches up on the hill one deserted bench somewhere, one yeah. little hidden away nook by a, like a bike under a tree. So it was quite nice life existing despite this in tragic ways, but also finding a way. So I think it was a nice walk. So, yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's wonderful. I did not know that. I thought Mumbai was completely fucked, but that's, that's a, that's a sliver of hope. Very early. Awesome. Early. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Dia Kohli, it has been a pleasure having you on this podcast. Is there a place where people can follow you, where they can check out your writings? No, I mean, it's not all in one place, unfortunately. I just okay. have to move in my... So just look up the name Dia Kohli and you'll have like a burst of writing that you can read. I've bookmarked all of the articles. I've only gone through about 60%. I still have to go about a fair bit. Uh, but she's one of the writers that inspires me to, to write with substance and, and not succumb to the buzzfeedness of our generation. So thank you for that. Thank you for your kind words and thank you for